and the Salafi follows those great imams. But we do not single anyone out with following to the exclusion of others. So the Salafi does not take one madhab and he blindly follows it even after the hadith comes to him. How do we understand the Salafi da'wah in light of the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali schools of thought? I don't think schools of thought is the right term, but anyway. Uh, the madhabs, these are fiqh schools. Many are under the impression that the Salafis belittle the Hanafi madhab and that the Salafis are literalists, lacking understanding of Islamic jurisprudence. Well, that's strange since Abu Hanifa was Salafi himself. So was Malik, so was Ahmed, so was Shafi'i. They were our Salaf and they were upon Salafiyyah and they taught their students to follow the madhab of the Salaf. And there is, they are aqwal from all of them, from Abu Hanifa, from Malik, from Shafi, from Ahmad ibn Hanbal, all of them advising the people to stick to the, to the madhab of the Salaf and to the path of the Salaf. And the Salafis are literalists. I don't know what they mean by If they mean that we are Zahiriyah, obviously we are not Zahiris. We are not Zahiriyah in fiqh because the Zahiriyah madhab is a madhab. And the Salafis aren't Zahiris. You know, it's like saying that every Hanafi is a Shafi'i. Of course he's not. Shafi'i is Shafi'i, Hanafi is Hanafi. So to say that the Salafis are Zahiriyah, then that's not correct. It's ignorance. You know, you've mixed up your madhabs. The Zahiriyah are the followers of Dawood bin Ali al-Zahiri. As for the Salafis, and the Salafis follow the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the Prophet sallallahu the Sahaba, the Tabi'een and the Atba'u Tabi'een, and the Imams who came after them as a whole, as a body. Because they are Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. They are Ahlul Hadith. They are Salaf linguistically, and they are Salaf in religiously, meaning that they are Salaf linguistically in the fact that the term Salaf means those who came before you. And they are Salaf in the sense that they are the Salaf al-Salih, meaning uh, religiously, in the sense that they are the most pious of our predecessors from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they are the Salaf al-Salih, the righteous predecessors. So we follow their fiqh. And we follow their madhab. And we follow their aqeedah, their creed, and their belief. So we do not criticize the madhahib, whether it be the madhab of Abu Hanifa or Malik or Shafi or Ahmed ibn Hanbal. We don't criticize them because these are madhahib in fiqh. And the Salafi follows those great imams, but we do not single anyone out with following to the exclusion of others. So the Salafi does not take one madhab and he blindly follows it even after the hadith comes to him. Because that wasn't the way of Abu Hanifa. No Malik, no Shafi, no Ahmed. And this is why you find quite often those imams saying like Abu Hanifa would say to his students, woe unto you that you write everything that I say for indeed I may hold an opinion today and I may alter it tomorrow. And likewise, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, la tuqalliduni. Don't blindly follow me. And don't blindly follow Shafi'i. No Malik, no Sufyan, no Athawri. No awza'i. Don't blindly follow, but rather take from where they took. Likewise, Imam al-Shafi'i. If the hadith is authentic, then that is my madhab. So they were themselves upon the way of the Salaf and upon the way of hadith. Imam Malik and Shafi'i and Ahmed, they were Ahlul Hadith. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, if the truth came to him, then he would adopt the truth. This is what we know, and I explained some of this last week when we had this discussion about the Ahnaf and the Hanafis. So they may belittle, they say that the Salafis belittle the Hanafi fiqh. No, we don't belittle the Hanafi fiqh. We may criticize quite severely the blind followers that we give you a hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then you come with the statement of Fulan from the Ahnaf, from the Hanafi scholars. So when we give you a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and then we give you Abu Bakr and Umar and we give you the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and all you say is this is my madhab and I'm not going to leave my madhab because my madhab cannot be wrong and then you have the goal and the audacity to say that we belittle them the madhabs it is you that is belittling the legacy of Abu Hanifa or Malik or Shafi and Ahmed 
that you have so much ta'assub that you will follow something in the madhab even after the hadith comes to you? When the salaf were not like this, the sahaba weren't like this. When he came to Abdullah ibn Abbas and they asked him about the hajj al tamattu so he, he, they, he informed them that this is the hajj of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa to perform the umrah in the month of Dhul Hijjah and then come out of Ihram and get ready for hajj and Yawm Tarwiyah on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. So one of the people in the gathering, he said, but Abu Bakr and Umar didn't say that. He said, I say to you, qala Allah wa qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and you say to me, but Abu Bakr and Umar said, I fear that stones will rain down from the sky upon your head that I say to you that Allah's messenger said and you say to me, but Abu Bakr and but Umar. This is the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. We are not literalists. As with, if they are referring to the names and attributes of Allah, no, you're not referring to the names and attributes of Allah because he says, lacking understanding of Islamic jurisprudence, are you majnoon? The Salafi is lacking understanding of Islamic jurisprudence and you can't give a single hadith for the way that you pray or the way that you fast or the things that you do in your ibadah and yet it is us who are lacking, lacking jurisprudence and we can give you a hadith for every single action that we do with the fiqh of, of Imam al-Bukhari or Ahmad ibn Hanbal or Shafi'i or even Abu Hanifa yet we are the ones who lack Islamic jurisprudence if the people of hadith do not know fiqh, then who knows fiqh? How do you come to a fiqh ruling without knowing the hadith of Allah's Messenger Wasallam? How do you come to a fiqh decision? How do you make wudu? How do you make ghusl? How do you make tawaf? How do you make hajj? How do you make umrah? How do you fast? Except that it is all established upon the Quran and the sunnah, the authentic hadith of Allah's Messenger Wasallam. It is based upon this that you come to your fiqh. So if ahlul hadith don't know fiqh, then who knows fiqh? As for the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the Salafis with regard to the names and attributes of Allah, then they take the texts of the attributes of Allah, that they take them upon their apparent meaning. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that he made istiwa, then we say that he made istiwa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascended over the throne, then we say he ascended over the throne. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about descending and the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through a hadith al-mutawatira regarding the nuzul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last third of the night, then we say that Allah descends in the last third of the night to the nearest heaven, just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith mutawatira that you'll find in all of the six books and other than them. We believe in the ru'ya, yawm al-qiyamah, upon the apparent meaning, because the ru'ya is something that is known that Allah will be seen. It is these people, the innovators, who ascribe themselves to the madhabs, but the madhabs are free of them. Because that wasn't the madhab of Abu Hanifa, no Malik, no Shafi, no Ahmed. That wasn't their madhab in Aqeedah. They may have differed in fiqh, but their Aqeedah was one. Their Aqeedah was one. Yes, Abu Hanifa did have one or two issues, and we mentioned those last week. But the direction of all of them was one. And the ijma in the aqeedah was established in the time of the sahaba and the tabi'een and the atba'u tabi'een. So anyone who erred from that, who made a mistake in that regard, then that's a mistake if you're from Ahlul Sunnah and we excuse him. But the ijma is established. The istiwa of Allah, the nuzul of Allah, the ascension of Allah, the descending of Allah, the maji of Allah, Allah, Allah coming forth, yawm al-qiyamah to judge between the creation. We believe in the hands of Allah, the face of Allah, the anger of Allah, the pleasure of Allah, the love of Allah. All of these are established for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is how the Sahaba understood. So they don't comprehend, it is true, they don't comprehend between that which is established in the hadith of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then the understanding of the hadith, it is possible for the scholars to differ. And this is where you find the differences in the madhaib. 
if there is an authentic hadith and they are using the same evidence but they come to a different conclusion, then that's understandable. You find that from the A'imma. You find that from Al-Albani and Bin Baz and Ibn Thaymin in this time. They are using the same types of ahadith, but their understanding of those ahadith are different. And that can happen between Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmed. That can happen. So therefore, those who are correct from the A'imma, from the great Imams, for them, there is two rewards. Two rewards. And as for those who are incorrect and mistaken, for them, there is one reward. As for the aqidah and the manhaj of those great imams and those who came before them, predominantly those who came before them, because the differences and the rise of the Ash'ariya and the Maturidiyya and the various other sects, even though from the usul of those firaq came before the appearance of the imams, such as the school of the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila, because that appeared in the time of the Tabi'een. As for what is prevalent today from those who ascribe themselves to Al Ash'ariya Kullabiya or the Mu'tazila Ash'ariya or the philosophers amongst the Ash'ariya and the Maturidiya, then all of that happened after the four Imams. So the four Imams. And the great compilers of hadith like Bukhari and Muslim. And Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Al-Nasai. And Ibn Abi Shayba, Abu Bakr Ibn Abi Shayba. And Ibn Khuzayma and other than them. That in their era and what they were upon, their aqidah was one. They may have differed in some affairs of the Amur Ijtihadiyya, Far'iyya. From the branches of the religion where there is room for Ijtihad. Tell me. Tell me. Is that against the way of the Salaf, what I've just said? Is that not the way of the Sahaba? Is that any disrespect for those Imams? If you want to follow the Imams, then do as the Imams did. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. They were, they were a'imma, they were Imams of the Salaf. And not a single one of the Imams. And we challenge them. From now till Yawm al-Qiyamah. Because those Imams have died, Rahimahumullah. Name one of them that said, follow me and don't follow others. Follow my fiqh and don't follow the fiqh of anybody else. That Malik would say that about Fudail or about Awza'i or about Sufyan. Follow me and don't follow them. Malik was the complete opposite of that. He didn't want the people to blindly follow him. Shafi the same. Ahmed the same. Abu Haifa the same. If those Imams and those who narrate from them, like the two noble students of Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, and Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani. After the death of Abu Hanifa, who did they study under? Malik ibn Anas. So much so that the most prominent narrator of the Muatta of Malik is Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaybani, who was from the greatest of the students of Abu Hanifa. They themselves visited other scholars. And that's why you find the likes of Bukhari saying that I studied under a thousand scholars. That's why you find Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal having hundreds of mashayikh, traveling thousands of miles in pursuit of knowledge, going to Yemen, going to the Hijaz, going to Khurasan, going to Naysabur and other places. Why were these Imams doing that? Except that they're seeking knowledge from other scholars. So how can a person come along today and say, forget everybody else and just blindly follow one man? And then they have the audacity to say, follow the first one, don't follow the other three because they came later. Because they just want you to follow Abu Hanifa. Blindly. Which Abu Hanifa never asked you to do. Nor did Abu Hanifa's students ask you to do. The latter day Maturidiyya, the followers of Abu Mansur al Maturidi, who died in 333, they are the ones who want to tie you into an aqidah that they invented. The Aqidah Maturidiyya, they invented under their leader and their founder. And then they said, even though he died nearly 200 years after Abu Hanifa, they say that the Aqidah of Abu Hanifa was the Aqidah of Maturidiyya. Allahu Akbar. A man who dies 200 years after him, Abu Hanifa was already following your Aqidah before you were even born. Majaneen. 
So what do they want to do? They want to veil you behind these blind followings of the madhabs to draw you into their aqidah of tasawwuf. So which Sufi tariqah did Abu Hanifa follow? Was he Naqshbandi? Was he Sahawardi? Was he Qadri? Was he Chishti? What was he, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah? All of these founders of those schools of Sufiya or those parts of Sufiya, the Gnostic parts of Tasawwuf, all of them came centuries after Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi and Ahmed. So they say, be Hanafi. Okay, I'll be Hanafi. But you can't just be Hanafi. You have to be Hanafi Maturidi. You say, hold on, you said Hanafi. No, you have to be Hanafi because you can't be Hanafi without being Maturidi. So the ignorant one will say, okay, who's Maturidi? Who's a great, big, great scholar? Imam. Everyone should be Maturidi. I say, okay, I took the Shahada, but okay. I took the Shahada and he only mentioned Allah and his messenger. Okay, khalas, no problem. I'll follow Maturidi. So I'm, I'm Hanafi and I'm Maturidi. Up until you start asking for the dates. You say, okay, if I'm Hanafi, which is no problem, I can follow the Hanafi madhab. Because it's permissible to follow a madhab, especially for the one who doesn't know. And he doesn't have access to ilm. And he's not a person who has ability to decipher between them. No harm if he's Hanbali, Shafi, whatever. But he has to be in fiqh from those madhahib. Because it's still possible in some parts of the world that, you know, it's that the knowledge of, of the hadith and so on, it's hard for the people to grasp, so they just follow the madhab. No problem. Meaning in fiqh. But these people don't want you to follow Abu Hanifa in fiqh. They want you to be Hanafi Maturidi. You say, okay, when did Abu Hanifa die? No, the first question you ask them. Was Abu Hanifa upon the Maturidi Aqidah? Say, yes. Oh, okay. Then I'll be Maturidi. When did Maturidi die? 200 years Abu Hanifa. Say, well, that maths don't add up. That maths don't add up. How can a man be a follower of someone who came 200 years after him? Right. Then they say, well, actually, it's not just Hanafi, Maturidi. You also have to be Chishti. Say, what's Chishti? Oh, that's the path of Sufiya. And it will make you pious and aesthetic. And, you know, you'll abstain from the dunya and you'll learn certain exercises, certain dhikr, certain adhkar that you repeat a certain number of times. And there's a particular type of modality in life that you follow that was developed by the Chishtiya school of Sufism. But is there any other school after follow? Well, you can also choose Qadiriya. Followers of the Qadir al Jilani. You say, okay. Anyone else? Well, Naqshbandiya. The school that came out of Bukhari. You say, okay. Anyone else? Tijaniya, if you're African. Anyone else? Well, you can choose Badawi as well. So now I'm a Muslim who took the Shahada that I worship none but Allah and that Muhammad is my messenger. But now I have to be Hanafi, Maturidi, Chisti, Qadir. Anything else you want me to be? And all of this hidden what? Behind the curtain of following a madhab. And that's why, this is why they don't like the Salafi. Because the Salafi is seen through your game. You want to call the people to the madhab and you say, don't be la madhabi. Don't be from those who are la madhabiya. The non-madhabis. The anti-madhab people. Keep away from them. Why do they want the people to stay away from us? Because we are the ones who say, Abu Hanifa was righteous. Malik was righteous. Shafi was righteous. Ahmed ibn Hanbal was righteous. They are from our Salaf. They are from the Salaf al-Salihin. And we love them. And we revere them. And we honor them. And we read their books. And we follow their aqidah. And we make books that explain the aqidah of those imams. And in their fiqh they may differ. So we don't pick and choose. We don't say, well, that suits me here. and that's Because the Salafi doesn't behave like that. Because the Salafi is Ahlul Hadith. In his origin, he follows the hadith, his mother is Ahlul Hadith. So what does the Salafi do? The Salafi says, I'm not going to pick and choose between the opinions of the scholars because that could lead to a person following his desires. So what does he do? He looks at the madhab like Abu Hanifa or Malik if he is following a madhab. And, he, and if there's a hadith that comes that supports the fiqh position, he takes the fiqh position. But if the hadith is mawdu or fabricated or weak or there's no hadith at all, and someone brings him a hadith of Allah's Messenger from Bukhari or Muslim or from the other books. And it is authentic. Then he adopts the hadith and he abandons the opinion. So he doesn't abandon it for whims and desires and just picking and choosing. But he abandons the opinion because a hadith has come to him. 
That's the madhab of Ahlul Hadith. That's the madhab of Ahlul Sunnah. That's the madhab of all of the four Imams and the great scholars of Hadith throughout the ages. But the, as the generations went on, that, they st that more and more people, they started to abandon. And even some of the fuqaha who ascribed themselves to the madhabs, that even though they were in fiqh, they were good, but they fell into some of the ideas of the maturidiya and the ash'ariya and the mu'tazila even, from those scholars who wrote about masail fiqhiyya and books, voluminous works in fiqh, that they fell into some of the errors of the ash'aris and others. Why? Because no one is immune. That's why you have to go back to the earliest times. Because the earliest time is immune. Khairun nas qarni. This is Salafiya. With what audacity do you say that we don't follow and we don't have fiqh? You have fiqh, we don't have fiqh. Stand in front of Al Albani with your fiqh and let's see how long you last. Stand in front of Bin Baz or even Ibn Uthaymeen. Sharon Mumti'. Let's open up. Let's, we'll see what mas'ala you want to bring. And let's bring Ibn Uthaymeen in his 20 volumes. Which, which issue you want to talk about? Ghusl. Discharge of a woman. Tarawi. Who leads the prayer? The wudu of the one who is following. If the wudu of the imam breaks. What issue do you want to discuss? Let's see if Ibn Uthaymeen doesn't have fiqh. And he's a scholar from this age. Imagine if you go back in history from the imams of hadith and sunnah and salafiyya. From within the madhabs and outside of the madhabs, meaning ahl hadith and from those who are script. Why? Because the madhab is in fiqh. What these people want to do is to follow a madhab so you leave the aqidah and follow their deviated aqidah. It is not, the, it's not their fiqh. You think Jumat al Tabli want your fiqh? They want your belief. That's what Jumat al Tabli want. They don't want you to become a Hanafi, it's just a, you know, like, a, like an outward show of what they want. What they in reality want is your manhaj and your aqidah. They want your belief. They want to strip your belief and then empty your brain from what is normal, empty it so now you're brainless, and then refill it with tabligh in nisab and fadal al amal. And then they give you a protocol what to do when you bump into a Salafi. Don't argue with him, don't engage with him. Don't talk to him. If you figure out he's a Salafi, turn away and run tail. Yes, run. Why? Because we're going to tell you Ahmad ibn Hanbal usul sunnah. We're going to tell you Imam al-Tahawi and the aqidah of Imam al-Tahawi. We're going to tell you what books of the Salaf have you studied. Which books of aqidah of the Salaf do you know? Name me just five Imams of the Salaf who wrote in aqidah. Have you ever opened up Bukhari? Never. Find me a tabligh who's opened up Bukhari and read it. And understood it. Hardly ever. Hardly ever. Barakallahu feekum. Let's finish upon that. Wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk.